So as uh, Steve's mentioned, this is kind of a few of the bits going to kind of run through, but yeah, so I, as part of my undergraduate course, I was doing countryside uh, management at uh, Harper Adams in Shropshire. And oh, I'm just going to hide this that way so I can't see my face. There you go. Yeah, so I did an undergraduate course in countryside management and I was kind of looking at kind of warden and rangery type roles at the time. Um, yeah, and part of that I had to do a, a sandwich course and I looked at a few different places to go and work and, uh, and Farrell popped up as a place to go. So I phoned up Derek and Holly who were working there at the time and said, have you got a place for a student? And they said, uh, yeah, no problem, come on up. Um, and then since then I've, I've worked on Farrell for the observatory, for the RSPB. I've been back as a visitor, I've volunteered there. And more recently, I've, I, until the observatory closed down uh, due to the fire, I was, I'd do a stint in the autumn, last week of September, first week of October, of uh, birding on Fair Isle and birding on Shetland the week afterwards. Um, so I know in total, I've spent at least two and a half years of my life living on Fair Isle. It's probably a little bit more now with the kind of short trips, but that kind of gives you a bit of a background of how long I've been there. And um, Steve's kind of gone through a few of the bits that I'm going to run through here, but uh, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this slide. Uh, but yeah, before I went up there the first time, I think I borrowed this uh, Fair Isle's Garden Birds. I think this is from um, Rob Sandon borrowed me this book for a bit. It's uh, just a uh, just crazy book, the kind of the rarities on Fair Isle. Like, my mind boggled with that. Um, and then whilst I was on Fair Isle, they've got this uh, um, Jim Diamond made this uh, the Birds of Fair Isle book. And it's just amazing little book of just shows the facts and figures of all the birds and just the phenomenal numbers that have gone through in the past. I know a few of the ex Fair Isle wardens are in the process of updating this book at the moment, so that'll be, uh, be fascinating when it comes out. So to show you where, where Fair Isle is, for anyone who doesn't know, um, so the, little, the kind of blue dot on the bottom is where I am at the moment, near Thurso, and the, uh, the kind of the red pin is Fair Isle, so it's about 25 miles south of Sumbra on Shetland, and about 25 miles north of North Ronaldsay and Orkney. And uh, I mean, one of the big, uh, the main facts that I kind of remember and had to uh, tell all the time is that you're actually closer on Fair Isle to Bergen than you are to London. Um, and one of the best ways to get there is on the Northlink Ferry from Aberdeen, um, which is just south of uh, kind of the, the Google sign at the bottom of this. And that takes you up into Lerwick and that's an overnight ferry. And then from there, you head back south, and I'll come on to how you get there. But there is other options that you could fly across from Aberdeen to land into Sumbra and work your way down. And uh, depending on the time of the year, you can fly it from uh, from Kirkwall as well and get there. Um, so this is the, the Good Shepherd, the fourth. Uh, so the uh, the previous three sunk. So uh, uh, the fourth has done a lot better job than the last ones have. Yes, yeah, so this is Grootness Pier at the south end of Sumbra. Um, this is where you hop on and this this ferry goes every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Um, and if it's a nice calm day, it's a lovely crossing. You can sit on this uh, on the back at the left and just go and enjoy yourself when you're going through looking at visitations. And if it's a bit choppier, then you might be a bit lucky and get your storm petrols and sort of shear waters and things like that. But if it's a bit too rocky, then you get seat belted underneath the, uh, the bottom of the boat. Um, and one of the worst days to cross actually is when they um when this this green part here comes down and um, that's that usually means that there's going to be some uh, sheep on the boat and you've got the uh, the smell of the sheep wafting through um this boat takes approximately two and a half hours depending on how choppy it is to get in there um, and he arrives in at north haven in uh, on fair isle and you can see the kind of uh the cutaway in the cliff at the back there and that's where the uh, the boat stored in the kind of the stronger weather, it gets winched up uh, just to protect it because the the, the kind of the winds and uh, water coming through here is just phenomenal. And there you go. Your other option of getting in is uh, it's flying into Fair Isle Terminal One. Um, at the time, this has got a really small little shelter, a little bench in through the door there. The bit of information has got a toilet in there, but the rest of the building is actually uh, where they store the fire engine until they built a new one, uh, a new fire station not long ago. Uh, so there's the fire truck um, and the plane coming in. So the plane is a little eight seater that leaves from uh, from Tingwall or Sumbra, depending on the day. 
and that comes in the days that the bump doesn't go. So usually Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Uh, you can see around the outside, there's a fence. That's just to keep the sheep off the runway. But because of the way the plane comes in, they have to have the ends open up. So the, the main reason for the fire engine being there, apart from just in case of any incidents, is to, to run around with the sirens and scare the sheep off the airstrip and uh, get the, uh, the great skewers off before the plane comes in to land. And that's usually between, uh, usually takes about 25 minutes to get in from Tingwell. So uh, quite a short flight, really. Oh, and the, uh, as well, the airstrip is only uh, about 530 metres long, so quite a short runway, uh, but not quite as short as uh, Fuller if anyone's uh, been on that flight. So here's a kind of general map of Fair Isle. So as, uh, as I mentioned before, North Haven is just by Boone S on the right. That's where your ferry comes in. There's a loop road that goes around the south and a uh, road carries on up through to the north and the airstrip is kind of generally in the middle. So that's kind of uh, kind of quite broadly what kind of is going on in Fair Isle. So it's about three miles north to south by one and a half east to west. Um, so here's the, uh, as it happens, this is the second bird observed just stayed in. And um, you see the importance of this, uh, this bit of vegetation out here. So well, I'll come on to it in a minute, but when the uh, when the old bird observatory was knocked down, um, one of the main things they said to anyone who's involved in the building was like, do not destroy this plantation because it was going to take another 30, 40 years to kind of get back to this kind of amazing stage. And luckily they did this from the old observatory, the new bird observatories that kept this vegetation. Unfortunately, they lost the side bit uh, due to the uh, kind of the extra bit on the side of the uh, observatory. But yeah, you've got quite an iconic uh, sheep rock in the background. It's, it is connected at the bottom to the uh, to the mainland, but um, they used to have sheep on top of that hill and used to kind of carry them back down on the backs uh, and get them off on the boat. So here's kind of the inside of the bird observatory, and it's a uh, it's a really social place when it was uh, when it was open. Uh, so it's got what you can't see around the corner. It's got a nice library. It's got um. It's got an education room there. It's got a ringing room on the side. But in this bit, if you come and stay, uh, when it opens up again, um, everyone goes for uh, food together. So they, they'll ring a bell, everyone goes through, so eats together, so it's really social. Every evening there's a log, uh, a bird log. So uh, the ward will stand behind the bar and read out and shouts out the numbers that they've had in the day. Um, quite social with the island as well. So they used to have a, a fair Isle Thursday. So the islands, some of the islands are really good musicians, they'll come down. Um, so it's just a nice, uh, nice little break from birding in the evening, and obviously there's uh, the bar there. Oh, one thing I was going to say about this as well is, is because there's no crime on Fair Isle, what we used to do is sit and um, and have a drink at the bar, but you could leave your, your wallet there, and you could leave your wallet for weeks at a time and just pull out your money when you need to, and uh, you know you don't need to worry about anyone stealing your wallet. I think like that's perfect. So unfortunately in 2019, a lot of you have heard about the, uh, the news that the Feral Birds Observatory had burnt down. Uh, it's quite shocking pictures and uh, it's quite scary just sitting in the house, seeing how far the smoke had been seen from Sumbra. Uh, it's quite scary. And so I, and I went back in 2019 because they're asking for people to come back and help with the census. Uh, so I stayed at South Light and uh, I managed to walk across the ground as it was on the kind of right hand picture. And it's quite scary because I know the, the kind of warden said in the past that um, when he walked through there, all the, the kind of stuff didn't have the same melting point. Like the ringing pliers are still out there. Some of the rings were still on the ground. Uh, as I was walking there, it was a bit later on, but there's still some pictures from the walls, um, some of the photographs that were on the outside. So that was, uh, that was just shocking scenes. But despite the uh, observatory being closed at the moment or going to be repaired, it should be, oh, I think they're supposed to be getting it ready for um, or having completed by October 22, uh, ready for opening in spring 23, but I'm not sure of the latest of how that's going to be. But you can still stay there at the moment. There's um, a couple of self-catering accommodation places down the island. Um, there's a couple of, there's four or five B&Bs that are open. Unfortunately, for, for most of this season, they will be taken up by workmen that are going to be uh, uh, putting the observatory back together again. But good to hear it's uh, progress has been made with this. So whilst I was doing my university placement, in the second part of that, I was um, I was asked to, to be the ranger for the season. And a lot of that, this is a, quite an old picture, you can tell, but, but it's uh, Derek Shaw, the old warden, gave me this picture. 
Um, but what we do is take people off cruise ships for part of when they were in, uh, go and show them the puffins, they go and wander around and uh, nibble your shoelaces, and that's them having a perfect day. Uh, besides birding, a lot of people come up to see how the, the, the knitting's made, and it's, it's still made there now, the fair on knitwear, still being handmade. Um, so you can have a little tour. There's a few examples of this in the museum as well. So on the island, uh, we have uh, breeding Atlantic grey seals. We have quite a few uh, common seals around as well. So a bit of a talk about the species we get there. We get um, rabbits, one of the kind of mammals that you see all over the place. They look quite domestic uh, type rabbits, um, rather than being this kind of traditional brown looking things. Uh, this is a feral mouse. Uh, so it's a subspecies of feral field mouse, but they're absolutely massive. Um, so you, if you catch a glimpse of one, you kind of feel like it's the size of a rat and they, they'll hang around underneath the bird feeders and they'll run, run at the walls on the outside of the, uh, the bird observatory as well. Uh, we also get house mouse here, um, but I think they're a little bit worried about the size of these field mice at the moment because they're probably big enough to take seabird eggs if they could get down there. Uh, quite often, some of you wander around, you can see the Shetland bumblebee, but I I'm not sure. I think it's now, um, I think it's a subspecies of the moss carder bee. But yeah, stunning little thing. Uh, we also get uh, a few buff tails and northern white tailed bumblebees around as well. I've had a few unusual uh, visitors recently, like there was a, a locust turned up, which was a first for Fair Isle about five or six years ago, a bit of an odd one. We get a few bats coming up, so it's the uh, the two pipistrel bats have been seen, uh, have been heard and recorded coming through the site as well. Uh, one of the crowd pleasers is uh, the orcas, they've become a lot more regular and they're now quite predictable. So if they're on the island, we um, through the WhatsApp group, we can say where they're going, where they're coming from, where they're likely to be next and people can get ahead of them. Uh, so it's good to see. I've also seen things like basking shark up there, a couple of humpback whales off the south of the island. Uh, when I first arrived, there was a minke whale uh, that spent three or four days on the side of the island, so you could see the white tips that swim underneath the water. That's that pretty amazing. Um, so I thought I'd talk next about a bit about the science of uh, a fair isle bird observatory. So the, the warden and assistant wardens will split the island into three sections. On, so you can see on the left, the north, southeast and southwest census. And they'll walk as much of this area as they can, uh, looking down the cliffs, checking all the geos, um, yeah, every little bit, every, any sort of ruin. Um, looking down the cliffs is one of the big ones for it, but even within the walls of the lighthouse and things like that. And then they rotate them every day, so everyone's in a different section, so you've not got an advantage. Um, I wouldn't really necessarily say as a favourite census because um, you can get a surprise anywhere. I think people feel a bit nervous, usually the visitors, about going north because you lose signal at the top, which means that if there was a, a big rarity in the southeast or southwest, uh, you're furthest away from the road and you might not necessarily hear about it for a few hours later. But one of the big and most important things about Fair Isle is the, uh, the science in the background. So a few of the directors of the Bird Observatory are scientists. Um, uh, so all this census data is collected in a standardised way. And um, so that will include what recording when census didn't happen, how long it roughly takes to do the census. Um, and that's allowed us to um, well, Will in particular, Will Miles has put this paper together uh, and this is basically shown, I'm just going to find this, that, um, so the full migration period has lengthened by five weeks over a 60 year period. Uh, and that's quite noticeable on the island. So, um, so that means that uh, migration is lasting longer and starting a little bit earlier. And that means that assistant wardens have had, been, had to have longer contracts because migration is still going on past the usual end and dates of the end of October. So we've got yeah, a couple of weeks into November now, which is one of my favourite times of the year. Uh, another thing we do standardised is the, uh, the bird ringing. So there's usually six trap rounds in a day, one before breakfast, one after breakfast, one before lunch, one after lunch, one before dinner, one after dinner. And that's also then a standardised way. Uh, so we record every time we can't do a trap round, for example, and that, that makes our science more robust. Um, and the idea with these, uh, these heligland traps uh, which is the bird catching method, is that you come in through the entrance at the far end, you clap your hands a little bit, the birds work their way to the back of the trap, and then the, you pull a string and the, and the door at the back with a little uh, weight and the, the birds drop into a little box where you can pull them out. And then you take them back to the uh, the bird observatory 
uh, put a ring on and do all the biometrics that you need to, and then they're, then they're on their way. So uh, call this kind of meet the locals. So there's a, a feral subspecies of wren, which is the, the Fridarensis race. And there's, there's usually, uh, I think 38 to 39 pairs is kind of the maximum, but yeah, at the moment there's about 30 uh, breeding territories on the island and they get counted every year. Um, there's uh, starlings who are resident on the island. There's, there's long-term studies on today's. Um, there's something God's going on with them. So, oh, basically they'll breed, they, when they hatch on the island, they'll spend the first winter away from Feral and they'll come back and never really leave the island for the next few years. And I think the birds in the south uh, I've got longer bills to probe through this, the harder ground, whereas the, it's the opposite of north. There's, there's little, um, little odd bits of, um, yeah, the, the bill's quite interesting. So it's got, yeah, the opposite. So long bill, short legs, and one bit. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm losing myself on this one a little bit, but um, I'll come back onto that. So some of the other species that you find around the island, kind of commonly breeding, stuff like, you know, Get a couple of pairs of raven every year. Sometimes a peregrine is around. House sparrows are everywhere. You've got kind of rock doves with the odd feral pigeon amongst them. Uh, skylarks, meadow pipits everywhere. A few of the waders. So, so one of the things you'll hear most commonly in the spring and summer is you've got the uh, the snipe drumming all over the place. That's really nice to hear. And then you've got all the seabirds as well, which I'll come on to a little bit later. So there's there's lots of studies going on with uh, with the kind of some of the the kind of more resident species, a bit like the swipe. So this has got a, see the one on the right, it's colour ringed, that means it's a spring ringed bird. And then they'll reverse the blue over the orange for the autumn. Uh, generally, they mostly turn up on North Ronald's Day and the other way around. So it's a, um, I think a few have turned up in the Highlands as well. But I thought the interesting photo on the left of the uh, the adapted uh, baby bottle, uh, don't often see twite on feeders. Um, some other scientific work going on on Feral is the, uh, well, this is a project ended now, but Adam Sheward was doing a PhD on wheatier migration. It was really interesting watching the uh, the weight of the uh, the wheatiers change as the day goes on. Yeah, so they'll uh, they'll lose weight overnight and then build up the reserves in the morning and then build up the reserves again just before they, uh, they go to roost for the evening. Um, within that, you've got small bits of, uh, of research for people who might want to come across for two or three weeks. Uh, so where me and my partner Nina came down to uh, to look for plastic uh, incorporation in nests. There's uh, quite a lot of plastic in the nests of the gannets on Feral, but um, they only started breeding in 1974. Um, that was the first breeding record, and now there's uh, about 3,500 pairs at the moment. But it kind of shows you the, the kind of the size of the cliffs on the west side as well. So. Part of my work after my so whilst doing my undergraduate course, as I mentioned before, I was doing a, a countryside management course. And on my first day on Feral, I was pretty much given a puffin as part of a diet sampling uh, project. And from then, I kind of pretty much realised straight away that I was going to be going down an ecology route rather than a countryside management route. Um, so after my my placement, I ended up getting a contract on Feral, working for the RSPB, and that was GPS tracking seabirds, so razor bills, fulmers, kitty wakes, shags. Uh, and here's one of the, uh, the gilly mot tracks on the right, showing how far they go. Um, a few years later, I ended up with another contract up there, GPS tracking the puffins. Um, some of them are going to go in a similar sort of distance all the way down to Aberdeen. That's kind of just shows how I've returned so many times doing different projects. I can't keep away from the place. So um, one of the things Derek always used to say to me when I first arrived was, uh, you have to get off the road to find the birds. Um, and I kind of thought it was an interesting picture because um, Arctic skewers breed around the roads in the north and the, uh, the roads will quite often melt if the temperatures get above like 10 or 12 degrees. And you quite often find Arctic skewers stuck to the road in the tar and you have to kind of uh, pull them off and shift them to the side and let them fly off on their own. Uh, but I also thought uh, with saying, yeah, I have to get off the roads. Uh, I do remember this uh, night heron walking down the road. This is a uh, for after my mark breaks of the, uh, the first night errand for Fair Alp, which I thought was pretty amazing. I don't think I've seen one any, anywhere near as well as that in the UK since. So kind of a bit of a tour of the north. The, um, the highest point is, uh, is Ward Hill. Um, so I'm just going to find how... 
so it's 712 foot and it's got a uh, the highest point at the top here and there's a uh, world war ii radar stations at the top um and this is a police communication mast as well so if, uh, if that goes down we're in trouble um but yeah if you put in the effort to get onto the top of this it's it's quite a hard walk for fair our standards but there's a few things you can find out there it's uh, it's quite good in spring for dotterel running around there um things like snow benting and lapland benting you like to drop in there so it's worth the effort and uh this kind of rocky habitat is quite strange as well so sometimes you might be sitting down on the ground and you might hear something like a storm petrel uh, making a noise because they'll, they'll breed amongst some of the rocks in this area um, so far I've got two lighthouses one in the north and one in the south this is the, the most northern one um, so you can't walk down this track anymore from the uh, the lighthouse because it's, it's undercut um, so I'm, this is a photo taken quite a while back from the foghorn um, and this is kind of kind of similar area to where I showed before. So this is Tor of the Ward Hill. Uh, and this is where I was holding that puffin on day number one. So you, you come down this kind of narrow bit on the right hand side and then you put up some mist nets. You're catching the puffins as they're going into the burrows and collecting diet samples to see what they're eating. This, I thought it's a good representation of the same same sort of thing as where you the way you kind of bird the island. So the idea is that the birds land in low and then work their way up through the day. So they quite often call Fair Isle an afternoon island for rarities. I kind of explain why now. Uh, this is an example of so it's, uh, David Parnaby and myself, uh, Richard Cope and Nina looking down on the cliff. And that's that's what you spend a lot of your time doing whilst you're birding on Fair Isle. So the, the birds are generally coming low and it's a Siberian chiff chaff on the, uh, on the beach. We'll have a little forage and they'll generally kind of work their way up as the day goes on. This is a river warbler found whilst uh, whilst out doing some seabird research. I think it was Jason Moss who found this one. Um, so it worked. It was at the bottom of the cliff and then ended up turning up in the bird observatory garden ten days later. And the only real realized the only way they realized that is because it had one tail feather. Um, otherwise, we'd have assumed it was two birds. Uh, it's really nice as they work their way up the cliff. You get a bit closer. It's, you get really nice views of things like uh, wood warbler. It's a nice. Uh, Northern tree creeper, which is, uh, I don't see them that well up here at all, really. They get a few brighter ones are getting a bit higher up the, uh, up the cliff. So golden oriole is an amazing one. I don't think I've seen anywhere uh, golden oriole anywhere as well as I have on Fair Isle. I might have seen them in the hand as well, but that doesn't really doesn't really count. But yeah, as they get through the, the top of the day, then this is the kind of top of the cliffs. There's uh, three common rose finches. Uh, once they're up there it's kind of a case of finding their way to the gardens and that's where they'll kind of hold the birds. So that's what I kind of mean by fairs and afternoon islands. That you can find birds down the cliff in the morning, but yeah, the, the kind of monster rarities quite often turn up in the afternoon. Here's a, a nice photo that Johan had taken. He's one of my, uh, my Swedish friends of uh, an Eastern subalpine warbler and a, a quail outside the bird observatory garden. Uh, quail's a nice one because I've only ever seen quail on fair Isle. I've not seen them anywhere else in the UK. Yeah, great to see so clearly. And I kind of split up the island here a little bit because that was kind of a rough bit of the, the north tour. You can see the airstrip here. But you can see the habitat change here it's from the kind of heathery north as it switches to the crofting land of the south. It is a quite good representation of it. So this is hill dike that separates off the sheep from the north, which are kind of communally owned uh, from the crofts to the south. Uh, on the track, you've got um, on the right, you've got the track that goes up all the way up to the mast. Uh, as you're walking through there, you're getting batted by bonksies most of the way up in the summer. But yeah, he's a yeah, quite showed it quite well with a, a pallid harrier flying across the uh, hill dike. So as I'm down south, I, uh, this is kind of looking from the south north. So you can see a uh, sheep rock again, kind of a bit of a kind of a bit of an orientation feature. Um, so the island is actually owned by the National Trust for Scotland, apart from the bird observatory itself. Um, so when I first moved up there, the rent was just £200 a year. I think it's gone up slightly from that. But what they do when they're looking for people to stay there is they'll look for young families to keep the school going. And they'll look for kind of perhaps entrepreneur type, type people that can bring money into the island and spend it on the island to keep the island going. So it, they can be quite selective on who they have there. And that brings about a really good community. Um, so they've got the uh, the Kirk here, 
as well. They've got a chapel at the top. Um, I think it's nice uh, orange and blue type houses. That's uh, Derek and Holly Shaw's house, if, uh, if anyone knows them. Um, so a lot of the uh, islands have various jobs, but a lot of them uh, are crofters. And so you see quite a lot of sheep in the south end. There's a few cows there. Uh, Holly and Derek usually have a few uh, pigs every year as well. You see the wind turbine in the distance. There's another couple of turbines on the uh, the island that, uh, that uh, power some of the accommodation there. And uh, about three or four years ago, they ended up with some solar power to top this one up as well. So uh, it, they had some generators that would cut in, uh, cut out every now and again. So you'd quite often be around an island's house for a party and they'll, all the power would cut off completely at 10 o'clock. So that'll be, uh, that'll be candle time. Um, what else have I got to say about that? Um, oh yeah, so there's, uh, it's about 60 islands on there at the moment. So I think about 80 when I first arrived in 2007. But I think they're building it up at the moment by redoing up some old crofts. Um, so this is uh, this is the shop, is the white building. So the left-hand part of this is the shop and the right-hand part is the, um, the shop owners, which is uh, Robert and Fiona. And what I was going to show with this is that, that um, just to the right hand side, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, the observatory works really well with the, uh, with the crofters and they've been allowed to plant trees in certain areas. And this one's quite well developed now, so you can't quite see it, but this is full of willows now and, and pines. So when you go to the shop, you can have a wander around here and do some birding. A little bit behind the building here, this is a uh, low stony brick. There's also usually a crop strip, which is quite good as well, which is, um, a bit of land that's spared for the observatory and they'll get one of the islands to put some uh, some some corn or something in for the season but what i also want to show here is that so fiona who runs the shop is also head of the fire brigade and she's also a director of bird observatory amongst other things so everyone kind of turns a hand at a few uh, a few different jobs so when uh, when david was working at Bert feral bird Observatory, he'd quite often run out to his fire brigade duties up at the airstrip um, yeah, so a lot of the islands have multiple jobs. Uh, this is kind of one of the old ruins, kind of, this is kind of towards the northern end of the south end. And this is just a, it's one of my favourite places to bird, because you're walking up to the croft, you have no idea what's going to come out with the buildings. Um, what I generally do here is walk the outside and see what's, uh, if it was the autumn, I'd walk through the uh, the nettles and see what I boots out of there. I've seen a couple of lanceolated warblers and things like that, but yeah, easy get like a Pied flycatcher or red star sitting on the roof of a building. You could, you could boot a long-eared owl out the side by accident, and yeah. But I think they're trying to do this croft up at the moment, so uh, that's going to need a lot of work. But it could be an amazing place. Um, a lot of the islands are very, uh, they're very aware of the environment they're in. They, they quite like the birds. So this is an educational uh, special protected area. It's pushed forward by the uh, the, the feral community themselves. Um, and they gathered their data themselves. So that was coming to me to get the, uh, the seabird tracking data. It was asking the PhD students about the wheat ear information, bringing in bits from everywhere. So I don't think this SBA would have happened if it wasn't for the community pushing it themselves. So it's an impressive work. Uh, the islanders quite like the birds as well. Um, so this is, there's the same feeder as you saw the white on. This is a uh, Tommy's feeder. It lives at a place called the Har in the South End. It's an amazing male common rose finch. You don't often see them looking that bright in the UK. And it was uh, Tommy that found this citral finch for first for Britain uh, at the time. Well, it's still now, but um, we quite often get a few reports from the islanders that um, for something like a rose colour starling might turn up and they know that it's something unusual. And, um, another example was Kenny, who works on the boats. He phoned up another bird with the starlings he wasn't quite sure about, and that turned out to be a brown headed cowbird. So they're very aware of uh, what's going on in the island, what's what's different when it's uh, when it turns up. Um, in the summer, for the uh, who want to go and visit, uh, one of the highlights for them is seeing the storm petrel ringing. Uh, so we have a few nets up normally uh, in the summer, and we're kind of near the ringing. And what what we do is once the birds are ringed, they have to adjust their eyes back to the light when they go outside. So uh, one of the highlights for the guests is just holding a storm petrel and waiting for it to fly off. Um, I couldn't talk about petrels without uh, talking about Swinhoe's petrel. So this is a, we catch a few leeches petrels, but yeah, Swinhoe's petrel was a nice surprise. Um, so I ended up seeing, well, they ended up with two uh, Swinhoe's petrels and I saw this one the first year. 
and I'm actually the second reoccurring bird the following year as well. So, but what I like about this is amazing that on the right hand side, a bird that I would say if I saw something like a subalpine warbler, a tree warbler, or a marsh warbler, it'd be an amazing day in like North Wales or Caithness. But yeah, it's just been swamped by a swing hose petrel. Uh, kind of thought like whilst I'm up here, July can always quite often be a quiet time, but on fair weather, it's taught me that I need to keep going. So I've been there for two two bar crossbow influxes, and it's just been amazing where the, the two bar crossbow has been absolutely everywhere. Um, one of my highlights for fair, I was actually seeing a white winged black tern flying around catching insects halfway down the island. Uh, it's really good. So black headed bents is another seems to be another July bird, and like your rose curl stars you expect, but. Another one, uh, Paddyfield Warbler seems to be a more re uh, more recurring July bird now. I've seen a couple of them up there. Uh, one of my favourite things about fair is you get to see birds up close. Um, so I've, I've never seen a, well, you wouldn't see a corn creek this well anywhere, but um, this is one I caught as I was doing a trap round. So I, um, I gave it to ring and in return I got, um, got to go and release the birds, but just yeah, amazing colours on this thing. Um, this is one of my favourite photos. It's uh, yeah, the wax wings are just amazing when they come in. So uh, this is a uh, Jack trying not to laugh because uh, a wax wings is just uh, pooed on his leg. Uh, every time you laugh and jiggle around, they'll fly off and then come back again. But yeah, most of the wax wings are quite drunk here. Um, one of the things is, as well is that I've learned a lot from being on fair. Was like my lanceolated warblers and things like that. So I, I now know well. I found one last time I was up with uh, with Nina, and they've got a special way of behaving when you boot them up. So they'll they'll fly up and fly short distance, whereas if you kick up a grasshopper or something, they'll fly a much further distance out of the ditches and land in. You can kind of see the short tail here, but it just kind of thought it's just quite a nice photo to show of uh, the kind of the detail that you get to see whilst working at a bird observatory. So uh, Farrell is quite known for its big five. So for, yeah, from the top left is Palace's Grasshopper Warbler, bottom left is a, a Lancelated Warbler again, bottom right, Great Snipe, top right, Pachora Pippet. Um, so I'm missing the fifth one because I didn't have a photo for it and that it's no longer regularly seen on Fair Arts, the Yellow Breasted Bunting. I think the last one was seen about 2006. So there's not been one in my time and I've not managed to catch up with anyone with one since, but it just kind of shows how, uh, how things have changed because they used to be quite a regular uh, August, September passage migrant with essentially up to six or seven seen in the season. Um, so one of the main things about uh, fair is its rarity. So 35 first for Britain. That's an impressive list. Um, some of the early ones, I was, I was quite surprised to see that Red Rump Swallow was the first, uh, the first one seen up there, because I thought that would more like to be someone like Dungeness, but then I realised actually it's so far back. It was actually shot by the original birders of fair That's the way they used to identify things. Um, yeah, so amazing birds in that list. Uh, so one thing I forgot to say is that um, yeah, the Feral list currently stands at uh, 388, which I thought was, uh, I thought was pretty impressive. So uh, one of my favourite things about Feral is um, there's different times of the year that are, that can be good for various things. But yeah, if you get right at the end of October, you've kind of missed peak uh, rarity kind of season, but you can get some amazing falls of birds. And I've walked around days where just blackbirds have been everywhere and kicking from underneath your feet. And same with the yellow browed warblers, I've had some really good days with them. I was looking in the old uh, Birds of Fair book that, uh, that Nick Diamond made, and there's a day in October 1979 with 65,000 red wings went through the island. I thought on an island by three miles by one and a half, and it's rise the island to sink from that kind of uh, that kind of level of uh, red wings. But even within that, you've still got a chance right at the end of the year of things like uh, pine benting or black throated thrush. Uh, really nice birds to see. So I gave this talk to Bangor Bird Group, and I think it was in about 2013. And so I've copied the same slide across. Um, so since 2013, uh, little egret and great white egret have been seen. Uh, Mediterranean gulls also been seen. Uh, but some of the kind of most recent additions to the list that have come ahead of uh, things like Avocet or I've got a list here of like um, long leg buzzard by Cold Tail last couple of years. Beating uh, Avocet to the list was Blackwing Stilt. Um, and surprisingly, Red Eye Virio was the first just a few years ago. So it's uh, 
there's still a few birds that they had tumble on the list. Um, it can be quite tough going on fair arse. This is a this is a October November picture. Um, so if the weather's this rough, sometimes you get a quite a good movement of uh, of little hawks. You can get a few hundred in a day, but that's if you can get out of the door. I've been on there with 100 mile an hour plus winds and uh, just had to sit inside and just read books and play Monopoly really. But this just shows how uh, how crazy the water can be up there. Um, and uh, talking to Gary about the Northern Lights before, so we've, uh, we've had them up here in Caithness not long ago, but it's, yeah, it's another quite regular occurrence on Fair Island. They can show really well. Um, yeah, amazing dancing lights. And uh, yeah, that's the end of my uh, Fair Isle talk. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening and uh, I'll take any questions that you might have. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you very much for that, Rob. Um, absolutely fantastic. Um, of Gary, are there any questions in the chat box? You're on mute there. Oops, sorry. Turn, hit the wrong button. Uh, not yet, sorry. Right, so, um, yeah, I, I was just a few questions there. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, I was lucky I managed to go there on a YOC holiday trip when I was about 15 years old. Um, and um, Show me age now. It actually well, it was it was not fair. It was actually near Sumbra. We did actually manage to get yellow-breasted bunting, uh, which is showing you how, how far back it was going. But uh, um, I, I remember at the time it, it was a female, like first year female, so it wasn't a, a very stunning looking bird. Um, and I, I needed woodchuck shrike, and there was one down the road. And I was wondering why we were spending so much time around this flock of sparrows. Uh, for this other bird that looks a bit sparrow-like, and uh, I'm very grateful that we did hang on for it now because I've never seen any more. And as you say, they've just um, got got rarer and rarer with the um, sort of the constriction of the range that was in Finland. It's gone back further east, um, uh, sadly. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, God, the, the birds to get there is just just um, amazing. Um, um, like you've seen things like Citral Finch for, first for Britain, that's that's just amazing. And uh, and being there for swinnows petrol and stuff like that, and hand feeding wax wings. Um, yeah, it's just just quality quality birds. And uh, I suppose it's just the because you're part of that local community, and um, there's only you on the island, really, isn't there? Um, have you ever been there when there's been uh, like like the Citral Finch uh, witnessing all the the top twitches arriving for like a first for britain have you seen that a few times yeah so uh yeah citral finch was quite a big one because there's lots of planes there uh, came in for that one um yeah swin host petrol was quite uh, another one which was a bit of a pain because uh we'd had restrictions about when we could ring when we couldn't ring and there's people phoning ahead saying is it going to happen tonight because they weren't wanting to charter a flight if if the wind was going to pick up and we couldn't uh we couldn't catch and catch anything and if we did catch a swin host petrol we'd have to close the net straight away which knack of the science of a storm petrel ringing. Um, yeah, there's, there's been quite a few birds. I remember one of, one of the big ones for me is that um, Hadonian Wimbrel turned up in 2007 mm. and it was one that all the Shetland birders needed. So that's one right. you get quite a few that have uh, Paul Harvey, Roger Riddington wanted to keep the fair while this going after I left. I remember sitting for five hours, just sitting, waiting for this, uh, well, just hoping this Hadonian Wimbrel would just stay in the same place. Yeah, so we get... We get quite a few people switching and and the way that Shetland's opened up for its burden now that it's so easy for people to come up and just go okay there's been a Lancy on Fair Isle for a couple of days or PD tips and they'll just they'll fly across and day trip it um so much easier to do now you get a lot of that or if it was something massive wouldn't there just be a waiting list for ages like for the because the planes can only take so many yeah there's um I think so a lot of the charters will come down from much further south i think it's the glasgow i think a lot of them are chartered from mm. uh, the big ones but yeah they'll they can they can charter some of the uh the, the flights from tingwell as well as long as they fit in with like a school run or something like that yeah um, so they keep going as much as they can and a few boats have made it in now as well because the boats are getting much faster than they used to right so it's uh yeah they arrive but they kind of expect the birds to be sitting there waiting for them and we don't have enough vehicles to kind of shift people around sometimes Right. Do they usually have limited time on the island as well? Yeah, yeah. It can be down to a few hours at times. For... Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yep. Any any other questions? Yep. Um, Jean asks, what is the food situation for migrating birds? <clears throat> Do 
do you put out food for them or is there enough natural supplies? We do have uh, feeders in the garden, but it's generally it's the natural supplies. So yeah, around the garden, we'll have lots of little flies for the fly catchers to go for. But if it's something like a crossbill, um, they'll go for the thistles. Um, they, like, they've clearly got no trees, but they'll go for anything. And stuff like the uh, the great spotted woodpeckers when I'll come in, they just land land on the telegraph poles or anything like that, and just try and dig into them. So it's there isn't that much natural food for them really. Um, so they, they, we kind of leave them to fend for themselves. Like I guess with the seaweed, they just dig amongst that themselves. So it's yeah, we, we can't really can't be part too much for them really. Yeah, I mean, I actually thought when you showed the picture of the tree creeper, I was thinking there aren't many trees there. <laughs> yeah, it's another one. Same for the uh, for the oriole. It's just they're completely out of their element, and they, I mean, they show really well for us, but they're they're probably struggling quite a lot of them. Mm. Um, we did get some interesting recoveries though. So things like the rose finches, we found that they can kind of reorientate themselves a little bit. So there's a ring bird that was on from Fair Isle that turned up at Spurn a few days later, which kind of suggests it's kind of reorientated itself. And the same for a, um, a barred warbler that turned up on Fair Isle and, and was uh, recaptured in the old Yugoslavia. Um, so it shows that they can work their way back. So they, they are finding food somewhere. Yeah. One of the other things actually that came to my mind when you mentioned about the gannets being a fairly new arrival, that's similar to new head on Westray. There were no gannets there in the 70s. And now when you go there, there's, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's hundreds of them. And they've also equally got loads of like um, plastic and fishing rope all caught up in their nets. Uh, sorry, in their nets, in their nests. It's a similar sort of thing. But I guess Westray and Fair Isle aren't actually that far apart, really. They're both yeah. similar, similar story. Yeah, they're amazing, the gannets. They're kind of... Uh... I know from the tracking studies that they've got quite specific areas to go to, so the colonies don't seem to overlap. So, uh, yeah, they're highly adaptable, so they're not looking like they're going to slow anytime soon. And they're just so adaptable to what they can eat as well. Mm. I mean, you just kind of picture them eating uh, mackerel, but they, they're good for anything. I guess that's why they're doing quite well. They can, yeah. they are more adaptable. As I said, I, I remember being told about the ones on Westray not being there when I lived there, although I didn't know it at the time. But... Cool. There's no other questions at the moment, but if anybody's got um, any, free. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you said that three of the Good Shepherds, the, the boats that go from Shetland to Fur Isle, have sunk. Um, were, were there any casualties with that? Was it bad storms or what, what happened there? Usually bad storms. It's usually, uh, usually for, uh, just breaking the harbour. Uh, there's, there's been no major incidents for them. Uh, people related, it's always been just not tied up properly. I think that's why they had to uh, build a noose and kind of take it out of the water just to keep this one um, in one piece. But they're looking mm -hmm. at trying to get some money from the Shetland Island Council to replace the boat at the moment. It's um, it's an old postal boat and that kind of bobs around like a little cork. So people aren't very well on that boat. Uh, right. But I think they're going to try and, well, they were looking at designing a catamaran just to cut the travel line down or just, just do anything to make the boat a lot more comfortable to get across. I remember when we went on the Good Shepherd, um, and it's the only time where I've seen understood when they say that people go green with seasickness, because um, it was so small and the, the the swell's so big up there, and you just disappear into a trough and you couldn't see the horizon because you were just in this huge trough that was a a little bit of an eye opener. But thankfully, it was only for about two and a half hours, isn't it? The crossing, something like that. So yeah. it's not forever. Um, where, where did the money for the rebuild of the bird observatory uh, come from? Was it mainly for, from charitable donations? Yeah. So the Scottish government gave part of the money. Um, uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprises gave part of the money as well, and the rest came from insurance, I think. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a hell of a lot of money went towards it. Mm. I think uh, they've managed to find someone to actually build it now, which is a worry because I don't know if you know the uh, the. The second bird observatory, I went to or the first bird observatory, um, when it was being built, uh, the company that made it went bust um, yeah. about three quarters away from making it because yeah. they got some of the heavy machinery stuck on uh, Fair Isle that meant they couldn't use it for other builds. So that kind of, uh, I think that's kind of made people nervous about this construction. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anyone's been to the, uh, to the last observatory before it went, but um, 
yeah, there's a bit of a rush to kind of finish it off and get other contractors in. So all the doors are hung on the wrong way. I didn't know it's about doors, but apparently there's a heavier end and a lighter end. So you go through the observatory and then you'd push the door handle as a fire exit type door and one door would be really light and the next one would be really heavy. So yeah, you're kind of sometimes pushing a door off its hinges. It's right. just, so there's little little things like that that I'm not quite sorted in the old observatory. So hopefully they'll have time to do this one properly. What, what caused the fire? Is it electrical? Uh, they think electrical, but um, I don't think they're uh, 100% sure. Mm. Uh, there's there's no definite cause been uh, mentioned yet. Yeah. Did you see many great snipe when you've been on there? I've seen two or three. Uh, is it two? Um, yeah, I think it's three. So I've got in here. Yeah, so one, I forgot to mention this one about the last great snipe I saw. Um, it had been bombed around the island. And a few people wanted to go and see it. So uh, we had a line of people to walk in towards this this, this last area's last great snipe we've seen. Mm. So we all went over the fence together, and my mate Doddy took two steps and booted up a locust ala from underneath his feet. And it kind of landed in front of everyone. So like, oh, everyone got a really nice view of a, a landslide warbler that didn't realize was there. And then, uh, yeah, two steps forward, a spotted crake flew up from the next patch. <laughs> uh, so it's just like just looking for a great sniper and that finding a lancy and a spotted crake. And it's kind of one of those sort of places. Yeah, that's amazing. If you walk yeah. around your own, you wouldn't have a clue that any of them were there. No. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Did you ever see them close the great snipe hole where they just usually flushed and fly off? Yeah, so we're quite lucky. Um, one of my friends uh, found one and it landed in a ditch, but mm. it landed in a perfectly uh, perfect nice place to view it from. So you could sit on the top of the bank and watch it. It wasn't yeah. going anywhere. Right. But uh, that's another one. I uh, we pulled up the truck to go and walk towards it and there's just a quail sitting in the middle of the field. Just, uh, just wow. Not even singing, just, just sitting there. Could you see it? Like, right on the open, it's amazing. Like, is it like that photograph you got with a quail next to the Eastern Subalpine Warbler? It's like sure. only on Fair Isle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, uh, mm. I was once at one of the crofts and I was, uh, I think most people had been off the island kind of doing some seabird work and I was sitting there and there was uh, an acro popped up in front of me and I was like, oh, flipping it, flies reed warbler. And I was just trying to get uh, some photos of the flies reed warbler, subalpine warbler popped up next to me. Wow. Like, Crikey, yeah. it's just, just an amazing place for that kind of thing. Yeah, oh, brilliant, brilliant, fantastic. So any more questions? Yep, yeah, we've got another one and it's, are there any sea eagles there? Uh, no, there's not. Um, so the Roy Dennis tried to reintroduce them, I think, quite a long time ago, but they didn't take. Um, I think uh, they all got fulmered and all disappeared off the island. So the ones that survived just just legged it and they didn't come back. Um, I suspect an older bird might be able to uh, to breed there, and I think Shetland seems to get some summering birds now. So it looks like they might turn up there at some point and breed again. Um, but yeah, not at the moment. It's, it's one of the frustrating birds for me because I don't really keep a proper feral list, but they usually go through an uh, unlucky time for me, usually a day or two before I've arrived. It happened like three or four years in a row. But um, I suspect white tail eagle breeds sometime soon. That's all for now. Right, see you then. <laughs> Rob, can I just ask? I mean, the, you, you, I think you mentioned that the, the island list is 388. In terms of breeding birds, how many breeding birds do you have? It must be only kind of 35 fish, I'm guessing. Right. That's with all the seabirds, the waders and all the kind of the resident stuff. Because, yeah, there's, like, through the winter, there's barely anything at all. I think they get excited when the, uh, the first skylocks turn back up again and oyster catchers. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it is just, just migrants, really. <laughs> So, so it gets very quiet, does it, in the, um, in, in the off-seasons once migration stops? Yeah, they get some quite big gull roosts and you get a few wintering geese and that kind of thing, a few wintering ducks, but yeah, not not too much there at all, really. I don't okay. think they I don't think they really get out. I know um, a couple of uh, the old wardens live there now, so three ex-wardens live there and I'll just drive around in the car and check some of the bays and that kind of thing, but, um, but yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be sticking yourself on the top of Ward Hill for that. <laughs> Rightio then. So, um, well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, brilliant talk. Uh, a magical place, uh, like one of the meccas for British bird watchers. So, uh, you know, a, 
you know, you gave us a great overview of uh, of, of the island people and also the the, the birds that you see there. So uh, um, thank you very much for that, Rob. And uh, it's good to see you again. Um, obviously, uh, it's, it's been a while. So uh, um, good luck with uh, with your uh, your job up there and uh, and go go and find some more uh, rare birds. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Rob. Cheers, Rob. Thanks very much.